John McDonald. I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer for the Council for School Safety Leadership. We are owned and operated by the Missouri School Board Association. And uh, we were set up to support school districts all over the country in the immediacy and the aftermath of school tragedy. So the work that I do today is work around the country with school districts that have experienced tragedy and loss of life, primarily school shootings. I've responded to seven school shootings now in my career and uh, spent uh, just over 14 years in Colorado in Jeffco Schools, the district of Columbine High School. So that's a little bit about me. I'm going to ask each of these gentlemen to talk about their backgrounds and who they are. And then we're going to get started with some questions today about the world of K-12 facilities and the intersection with school safety. You first? You first. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Joseph Sanchez. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Palm Beach County Schools. Um, been there a total of 13 years. Uh, took a break for a couple of years to be out in the contracting world. Uh, but all together, about 13 years. And my responsibilities are facilities, transportation, food services, and a couple other things. Um, Palm Beach County has its own, our school district has its own uh, police force, which is direct, reports directly to the superintendent. Um, but I work hand in hand with the, the police department to, uh, to make sure that we have all the physical improvements for our schools that are necessary. Uh, if you're not familiar with the, the, draft, the draft, <laughs> geography of, Palm, of uh, Florida, we are one county north of um, Broward County, which is where uh, Marjorie Sullivan Douglas took place. Um, actually, I was working in um, Broward County at the time that, uh, that that event took place. And um, right after that, I, I held a, a conference uh, for school safety and security um, with the focus of trying to make our schools safer without making them feel like prisons. And that was, that was a well turned out. We had about 200 people there, uh, architects and contractors. And so I've, I've stayed intimately involved in school, school security. So I appreciate being here this morning to share with you. Hi, good morning. My name is, whoa, hello. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Mike Eaton. I am the Chief Operations Officer for San Antonio ISD, a little south of here. Uh, I've been there going on one year at the end of this month, so uh, I'm still not used to the Texas uh, weather heat. Um, I come from a small city that was next to John uh, called Denver, Colorado, um, where I was a chief of safety for 12 years. So I had all security and police operations as well as emergency management for the largest school district in the state of Colorado. Um, and decided to move into the operations realm after spending the majority of my career both in higher ed and K-12 um, um, school security and law enforcement. Uh, it's been a, a great uh, a ride so far down San Antonio as we look at opportunities to invest in school safety solutions and look at um, having a different lens now as a COO of how we're allocating uh, our dollars specifically related to uh, some of the Texas requirements uh, for school safety now. So I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And Mike, as a Texan, just wait around a little bit. The weather <laughs> change. <laughs> That's just the way Texas is. Uh, my name is Leroy San Miguel. Um, I'm with uh, Northside Independent School District. Been there for about 14 years now. Seems like I just started last week um, and uh, gone through a multitude of different programs. Um, we're, uh, we were considered a fast school, uh, school district up until about a couple of years ago, right? That pandemic, as you, some of you can imagine, uh, where we lost some kids. Uh, however, we build a lot, and so part of the security aspects of what we do has, has gone literally, you know, 15 years ago when we have started having discussions about how to secure our facilities. Uh, and certainly there was a lot of discussions with the Board of Trustees, our superintendent, um, and it's, it's, you know, I, being a Texas native and being in San Antonio, only maybe an hour and a half away from Uvalde, that tragedy happened, it just breaks your heart. 34 years in this business, I thought I would never have to uh, deal with those kinds of uh, consequences. So for it, put, it puts a different perspective on, on life, but it also puts a different perspective on what your responsibilities are to ensure that uh, the safe environments for our, for our children. And so I look forward for a healthy discussion uh, here today, and hopefully we can impart some 
information and, and uh, skills and experiences that you can you can take with you. Thank you all. Uh, how do you each find the balance between creating a welcoming environment and that fortress building demand that we're seeing so many of the school <laughs> safety issues seem to uh, seem to stand up and require right now. And, and where is that balance? And how difficult it is is it in your work to find that balance? Joseph? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I find that um, people's tolerance for for um, for safety are are shifting, you know, where you know people were much more uh, wanting to be free and have you know freedom. I think people are much more accepting now of, of the inconvenience of safety and security. Um, in Palm Beach County, we just did a uh, pilot with uh, metal detectors in our high schools, and they the same principals who are now asking for metal detectors were the same principals saying that there was no way that we ever put a metal detector in our school because Perception, you know, ten years ago was that if you needed metal detectors, or if you had metal detectors, your school was unsafe. Now the perception is that if you have metal detectors, your school is unsafe, right? Um, so it's, it's the perception is definitely changing. I, so try to find that balance. And like I said, that conference is all about trying to make our schools feel safe without making them feel like prisons. Is you know, you, we continue to add more things, and if we can make things invisible, that's that's even better. Um, you know, we all have at, in our school district now a, a badge, the strategic badge. Some of you may be familiar with it. You press it a certain number of times, and you can, you can have a, a local alarm. You press it more times, you can have a, a 911, and the cavalry comes running. You know, those kind of more invisible things that we can do, um, the better. And that's, I think that's what we're trying to, to accommodate. But we do have fences around all of our schools. We have, now we have gates and card readers around all of our schools. And um, you know, those things are... Hopefully, we're trying to deter people, um, but at the same time, we're, we're still looking at other more, more high, you know, higher deterrence. Like we're looking at um, uh, anti-climb fencing, which is not pretty, but uh, we're finding that in certain situations where we have people who just, for convenience sake, want to climb a fence and walk through our school to get to the other side. You know, we have we have to put some stuff up like that. Up. So, uh, I, I think, like I said, I think that the overall the 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 perceptions are shifting to people saying, you know, and I'll deal with this a little bit in between just to make my school. Mike, are you finding the same? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things we think about is I think everybody's heard of compartmentalization and how do you, you know, build that, compartmentalize um, a potential school threat to allow, you know, emergency responders to get there. And, you know, you need to test that obviously and know whether you're in a rural area, suburban area or, or urban area, what, you know, those response times are. But I think that what's real important for us to acknowledge, and I know this is hard to acknowledge, but we can make our, unless we want to make our schools look like prisons, we are never going to be risk-free. And so how do we continue to, you know, mitigate that risk as low as possible? Um, because I, you know, I, you know, again, I was in Colorado during Columbine. Uh, I had two kids at Arapaho High School during that shooting, uh, two of my boys. Um, uh, we've had, you know, situations with kids bringing guns. We had a shooting outside of a school in Denver when I was there. And it seems that after each one of those, you know, horrific incidents, people come out of the woodwork to try to sell you any type of security solution that that, that is going to mitigate it. And at the end of the day, you know, a a you know a a all inclusive safety plan is really what you're looking for, and that isn't just you know the the perimeter security. It's also you know your culture. It's also you know how you're training your staff, your your students. Um, you know when you look at the data, the majority of school shootings occur outside the school, and a lot of them are insider threats, meaning there's students that go to that school. And so no matter how much you try to target harden, you know, your, 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 your school facility, you still have those, those dynamics that exist that you also have to take into consideration. And so it really is a balance, and it's, and it, and it's not the same for every school. And it's really important that as you do your security uh, vulnerability assessments that you do identify it, and also being at the table when you are building schools or also renovating schools, making sure that somebody from your security police 
team that has that mindset is at the table when you're building those designs. Thank you, Mike. Leroy? Uh, I, I think all of us uh, agree that um, it, it's, it's a very comprehensive uh, program, so to speak. And for us, we look at it as a three-legged stool. People, procedures, and facilities. And you all know that people can circumvent the, uh, the security at any given time. You all heard, and I'm sure you read, that the first reports coming out of uh, what happened at, at, at Uvalde was somebody propped a door open. That's people. So we have to ask ourselves, is there, is there anything there that we need to do to ensure that things like that don't happen? And then you have procedures. Uh, for most of us in the public, and we've always had emergency planning uh, uh, types of programs and or procedures. Uh, but during this series of events that have happened, it really calls the attention is you need to look at it more carefully and ensure that you have whatever procedures, all the training. Now, for us in Texas, we're required to have training. Uh, TEA and the Safety Center, they dictate a lot of what we do uh, in terms of training. And, and then you take that and you couple it with what, it, what happens, like, for example, in uh, the cultural aspects and, and try to mitigate those to the best of your ability. And then you have facilities at the end of the day. And you all know that, you know, we don't want to, our facilities to look like prisons. I had two board members approach me and, and I was making recommendations to secure a very open uh, uh, school that had five or six different buildings and trying to secure that was very challenging. And so they, they, they pleaded with me not to look, make it look like a prison. And so we're finding ways to be able to mitigate that, um, trying to use all kinds of different uh, methodologies to, to make it uh, as comfortable as possible. Cameras, access control, my gosh, the Raptor system for those that vis visitor management systems, security lobbies, uh, strategic uh, you know, patrols. We also have our own police department of 100 and some uh, <clears throat> peace officers, but we don't have enough for the elementary schools. We have 83 elementary schools. As it is, we can't hire police officers. I don't know if you guys can, but no, we certainly can't. Uh, and so we have to make do, even if we have the money. Uh, so it's, it's a, like again, it's a three-legged stool, so to speak, and it all has to uh, go in balance, be in balance. Thank you all. So there's a very real challenge uh, in keeping up with responsive maintenance in uh, our schools, especially for locks and doors, and there's limited staffing for this. How do you... How do you manage the issue and the concern of this? Because this is a real concern. It's not cheap, is it? It's not cheap at all. Um, you know, one of the, uh, we're talking about people, one of, the, one of the policies that we just passed in the last, say, 16 months or so is that, um, and this is just recent, is that all teachers have to keep their classroom doors locked at all times, right? And, uh, a, and we know that, especially in secondary schools, teachers like to prop their doors open during class changes, which is another problem because that's also a fire code issue, right? Because most of those doors are fire rated doors too, so they can, can be doing that anyway. Um, but those, that's, that's part of the, the, the issue that we're overcoming. Um, but we're, give me the question again. Well, the responsive maintenance. Maintenance, maintenance, that's a big issue. So I was talking, so we, a big issue was um, work orders, right? So we had, uh, we have a lot of work orders for um, a lot of different things, and, and the work orders for locks is, are treated as emergencies, right? So that means that we're responsible for getting them fixed within 24 hours, really. And um, some of the things that we're trying to do with that, because we don't have enough staff, I have seven lock and window people responsible for 30 million square feet of facilities, which is ridiculous. So what we're looking at is, um, we're looking at taking the preventative maintenance portion of our lock-in windows and, and outsourcing that. Uh, so have somebody, a vendor, just do you know, this, the oiling and the, making sure everything works. But our, we want to keep the security purpose, we want to keep the, the sensitive security issues with control of the keys in-house. Um, so we're, that's the, the method we're taking. We've, we've, uh, and like, I'm sure like most of you guys, we standardize our uh, lock, and, uh, lock equipment, so we should have that on hand. One thing that kind of hurt us to some extent, and this may be helpful to some of you guys, is that um, we went with an outside vendor to handle all of our inventory. 
um, you know, I won't mention the name of the company because there's, there's nothing against the company, but we, we went to just-in-time delivery for all of our inventory. And that got us to a point where we didn't have all the inventory that we needed when we needed it to fix, fix the locks. So now we're going back to um, keeping inventory on trucks, which, which we got away from that for auditing purposes, but now we have to go back to that because we need to have that. If we have a work order come in, we, need, we can't have the excuse that it's going to take two weeks for a part to come in. It's, it's got to be there right away so we get it fixed. So that's some of the things that we're doing. And obviously, we're trying to hire more people, but that's a struggle. Yeah. I, finding people is becoming impossible these days. Absolutely. What are you doing, Mike? For so I think I, I'd like to answer that in two parts. I think one is in San Antonio being a, 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 an old district or an old, old area where we have a lot of aging buildings. Um, um, you know, one of the challenges we have is that we don't have, you know, air ventilation uh, in all of our classrooms. Um, you know, a lot of it was designed to be in the main hallway. And so we started to go to a lock and prop um, where, you know, you keep the door locked, but you can prop it open and then an emergency boom, you can shut it and you're locked in. The challenge is we've gotten some feedback from TEA that doesn't want to allow us. So now I got to figure out, okay, how do we in some of those um, hotter months that I'm getting used to down here, how do we get air circulation to those classrooms if we're required to do that? I will tell you an approach that I took in Denver around school safety that really was a low-cost solution. You know, we think about, you know, you can buy all these nifty gadgets that you could put on classroom doors if you have to lock down. I basically, uh, for a district of about 208 schools, 93,000 kids, I spent about $3 million and put push-button locks in every classroom and every office across the district. And then on our common areas where we had the crash bars, we just had those converted to like a, like a little switch that basically, so anywhere you're at in that school, if there was a lockdown, whether you're at lunch, auditorium, you could get behind a locked door and physically lock that door. And I will tell you the push button as well as the, the just the, the throw switch that pops out that, that crash bar, low maintenance, low cost. And we provided them a, a opportunity to lock down anywhere they can in that school uh, uh, in an emergency. Guru, what does responsive maintenance look like for you? So, maintenance, wow. <laughs> uh, some of you that have maintenance departments, you know what I'm talking about, right? First of all, you can't hire enough people, and that's uh, out of 250, I, I've got about 100, and I'm lacking 150. And it's become challenging across the board. Um, but we, we, we sat down together, our maintenance department ourselves, and we ask ourselves one question, and is how can we make sure that those doors are, uh, are fully functional? And at the end of the day, we decided we we're going to check every door in the district. Now, like I said, I've got 128 facilities, big, large, 450,000 high school, uh, square foot high schools, and everything in between there. And so we went that summer uh, to be able to check every single door. What we found was you had to pivot. You had to really think about how, you, because not just a regular carpenter can, can do door maintenance. We had three, lock, three uh, uh, hardware uh, maintenance technicians, and we put a, believe it or not, a training session for our other carpenters that deal with doors and things of that nature. So we had to do that very rapidly. Put a presentation for them, we do it all in-house. We got some vendors that come in and kind of help us out as well. And so, uh, we have 29,754 doors in our district. I didn't know that. How long we 29,000. At 5,007 exterior doors in the district. I didn't know that either. And when uh, they asked me how, uh, how you how, what was the biggest challenge is trying to pivot and make sure that the maintenance department was geared up to do whatever they needed to do. Uh, to be able to check those doors. And you'll be surprised what you find. If you haven't touched a door for 10 years, there's cobwebs in it, there's all kinds of stuff in there. So you have to make sure that you train them up very, very well, very good, uh, and then try to uh, develop a program. So now we check all our exterior doors, all our interior doors during the summer. So we just went through the second phase. And then we have a program by which, uh, if you're in the state of Texas, you know, we get audited, right? See my friend over there. The same thing, right? Uh, and uh, the, that was a, a, a mandate coming down and, uh, from TEA, and then it pushed it out to the service centers, and that's where we get our audits from the service centers. 
So they come unannounced, they come and do our checks, uh, and then they write what they find, whatever it's a door is malfunctioning, or a door that's propped open, or they don't have a sign-in sheet, I mean, it goes on, the, the, the pretty healthy list. So, and those are reported to the Board of Trustees directly under closed session, because the last thing we want to do is share that information out to the public, and the, you know, I'll, I'll say it, the crazies will get that information and use it effectively for, for uh, trying to come on campus. So from that perspective, uh, we, we get those reports. I, I sit with the safety, security, and the board of trustees, and we look at everything. And yes, there are some door hardware that malfunction, so we got to go fix it. And I'm, I'm kind of like you. Our commitment is 24 hours. I get a phone call, and by 10 o'clock in the morning, usually we're there within four or five hours, but 24 hours to 48 hours is our response time. It's a commitment that we made uh, to, uh, to make sure that our campus administrators and Certainly the parents feel comfortable that we're going to get on it as fast as we possibly can. And we will have mechanical failures. We also, because we're standardized and have been for the last 15 years, on the hardware that we use, we stocked up in our warehouse. So I've got a stack of uh, hardware that if something malfunctions uh, and we can't repair it easily, we'll just go and replace it immediately. So again, we had to pivot. And I told the business guy, and I said, when I go over my budget, be nice, okay? <laughs> Be nice. They're never nice. <laughs> <laughs> they never played nice. <laughs> oh, no. Well, yeah, absolutely. Give just uh, one more question, then we're going to hand it out for questions for a few minutes. Leroy, you brought something up um, that I'd like all three of you to talk about, and that is mandates. Legislative mandates across the U.S. are impacting school safety decisions. They're impacting the decisions that school districts are making every day and prioritizing where they're spending money. Can each of you talk about the challenges that those legislative mandates are are, are costing you and you impacting you? And I'll start with they, you, Leroy. They cost. <laughs> no question about it. You know that, and I'm, I'm trying to be politically correct here. Don't be. I think. I think, no, <laughs> don't be, right? Uh, the people that for us in Austin, I don't think they look at it from the same lens that we do as facility uh, owners, so to speak, or public education. So, so sometimes they put in there things that are very, very difficult and challenging for us to, to accommodate. And yes, uh, TEA, or Texas Educational Agency, uh, has a jurisdiction over a lot of what we do. And they said it mandates to us when uh, shootings happen, not, not Shortly after that, we got our first level of, of, uh, of requirements that dictated various types of uh, fencing, various types of uh, procedures, and things of that nature. And so when that comes to us, we have to decipher that. And um, there for a while, when the last mandate came in, it's called for a non-scalable fence. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, <laughs> we tried to figure that out really fast. Like we had architects, they couldn't even figure it out. So we had to go call TEA and try to determine what a stand scalable is. And so they came out with some suggestions and rules, you know, uh, to be able to help us. And so they, everything was in flux. And board members are attending conferences and they're healing all about. And they come to the facilities guy says, "What's a non scalable fence?" <laughs> and we're trying to answer that to the best of our ability. So we've sorted through a lot of that, but those mandates are there. Some of the older schools, uh, I know my colleague here, may have the four-foot fences because it was they, life was easy and simple. Because you installed them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I installed them when I was there, right? <laughs> but you know, don't get the kids to run off off the playground, right? Well, now six-foot fences, and now if you use chain link, it's eight-foot fences, right? So uh, we've gotten a lot of that information clarified over time, uh, but the those mandates are becoming critical. Um, and how you try to figure out a way to be able to secure a, a campus. Uh, and they're still coming out. Um, and so uh, we, uh, we try to do the best we can to try to get the funding that's, that's to be able to, to ascertain that. And some of them are going to be bond because it's pretty massive. Yeah, and I think to piggyback off of what Leroy's saying, because I'm here in Texas as well, is it's the unfunded mandates, right? I mean, you have, and yeah, I'll go back to my Denver days. John and I, we, we testified together at the, at the Colorado legislature when they were coming out with the Claire Davis Act that, you know, basically took away governmental immunity to school, to school districts when they were found to be negligent. 
Um, however, that standard of care was never identified. Just like as Leroy is saying that, you know, eight foot non-scalable fence is never identified. Unfortunately, and I'm not going to be politically correct, unfortunately, we have folks at the political level that are making mandates and requirements for school safety that have never spent a day in a school. And they don't understand that culture and they don't understand how hard it is to balance that school safe, you know, creating a school safe, safe environment versus, um, you know, the total lockdown and, you know, prison looking type situation. And they don't understand how to accomplish that. They're making decisions based upon one incident. And a lot of the responses in regards to the Texas requirements are coming out of Uvalde, which was tragic. I've been to Uvalde. Uvalde is a very small school in a very, you know, kind of rural area. Some of those requirements that they're thinking about in regards to, you know, mitigating or preventing another Uvalde just simply doesn't work in a 3,000 student high school. It doesn't. And so... So those are challenges where, you know, they're trying to do a one-size-fits-all when, when it, it isn't that. And so, therefore, you know, you don't have the funding. It's a, it's a knee-jerk response to, for, for political gain. And it's a, usually a one-size-fits approach where that doesn't exist in, in K-12, in my opinion. In, in Florida, um, so right after Stoneman Douglas, um, you know, there was a big commission put together, and, um, and this commission still exists today, uh, and they, they continue every year to come out with additional requirements, additional mandates. One of the mandates that they came out with is every, every school, elementary, middle, and high school, has to have a, at least one police officer on campus, and, and that's been a challenge for us. As, it, as we all know, it's hard, hard to hire people, so... Um, we don't have enough of our own police officers to cover schools, so now we have agreements with the municipalities, so they provide uh, police officers or the sheriff's office, the county sheriff's office, and they provide them. So we have them. We meet the mandate, but it's not with, with our own people. It's probably about 80% with our own people. The rest of them are outside. Um, the other things that, that they come down with is they, they come up with all this list of best practices, which they say, so we don't, you don't have to have security cameras in every school. You don't have to have card readers. You don't have to have fences around it, but they, all these things are listed as best practices. And one thing you have to know about Palm Beach County, when you hear the name Palm Beach, you think, <laughs> you know, they got money, this is, the, the expectations in Palm Beach County are, uh, you know, ridiculous. So parents, when they, when they hear something as a best practice, or they, they wanted something, they see something, um, it becomes a mandate because, <laughs> because of the expectations are there. Uh, so, we, you know, that's, and then you have, for political gain, you have our politicians who will go from school to school, they'll meet with the parents, and they'll say, you know, this is a best practice, and, you know, you hear them, and they'll say, they turn to me, Joe, when, when are you going to get this done, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that, that becomes a regular issue for us. But, you know, some of the, man, most of the mandates are around, we have to have um, different teams of people who are um, doing health, doing security assessments of our schools. Um, you know, the principal, the, the school resource officer, a mental health professional, and those kind of things who are, who, are, who are looking, identifying what the risks are. We have to do annual reports. Um, but really, the, the financial part comes from, you know, the cost of the police officers is definitely one, and then the expectations that we have to meet. John, real, can I add real, real quick? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I think that, you know, as we talked about, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating because these folks don't, you know, work in schools. I, I think that the, the takeaway here is, making sure that your school districts have good lobbyists and that they are connected at the government level, connected at, you know, the legislative level, so that when you or your leadership needs to have those tough discussions, there's a, you know, there's a connection there. Um, we, and again, I'm just going to piggyback off of, of John and I, when we were in Colorado, where we knew that that school safety legislation coming down was going to create some challenges that we just couldn't mitigate. And so we partnered and, and got our legislative affairs folks involved to where we sat down with the folks, some of the folks that were on that, on that panel making the decision, state representatives, and explained why and advocated to have a member of school safety, a practitioner in the work, on that panel who's going to make decisions. And we got it. And so it, it, it's important that 
you just don't sit back and say, yeah, well, you know, I guess they're going to mandate we do this. We've got to figure out how to do it and allocate the money. If it doesn't make sense for kids, it doesn't make sense from a practitioner level, you know, challenge it and utilize your connections to do that. Thank you all. There are some questions, and, and we can't see you at all. <laughs> so if you get some questions, just uh, raise your voice. Yes, sir. Had with our hierarchy had a classroom submaster, so the had a corridor tumbler, uh, in, indoor tumbler. Um, well, what we just decided because we're building a new school right now is going with a like a storeroom lock, which is locked at all times. And when you said push button, I'm just trying to wonder maybe I need to do the push button. I'm, I'm looking at push button versus storeroom. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, you know, it, it really depends upon your district, right? I mean, if, you, if you're if you operating, you know, 24-7 or all through the school day where every classroom has to be locked all the time, then the storeroom lock is probably okay. And when I was in Colorado, we weren't operating that way because we felt we had compartmentalized and created good, you know, um, through secured vestibules, through secured wings that we created, um, you know, good security practices where we were going to allow classrooms to maybe have their door open during the day mm -hmm. or um, uh, students are working out in a breakout area and so you got to bring them back in. So we wanted to make sure, what we wanted to eliminate was a requirement for a teacher to have to go find the keys, go outside the door and lock the door. And so that's why we went to the push button. So it's interesting uh, because before uh, the last rounds of uh, tragedy happened, we actually, we have metal frames. Um, and so the region uh, provided us with some magnets. Uh, and they're little strips about this wide. They cover about that much. You put it on the actual strike side, right? And it doesn't engage the lock. So by, by then, in case of a lockdown, all you have to do, because I'm, I'm with Mike, we don't want the teachers fumbling around for them, trying to find the key, things of that nature. You just pull that magnet out there. And the door's always locked, by the way and it latches and it locks. So that was a quick and dirty. So we still utilize part of that, even though our mandate to our teachers is keep it locked. But when you have to have, in secondary, they, the kids move around, you all know that, right? Uh, they go here and there. Then you can pull that down temporarily and then pull it back up when your kids are all in, in, in campus. Little things like that just help mitigate some of the, uh, uh, the challenges we have with making sure that the doors are, are locked during the course of it. By the way, when we announced that, superintendent announced that you thought he shot some of the principals to the heart, that how am I going to mitigate all of that when you have kids in secondary going to the counselor or going to a rest? Portables. Anybody have portables around <laughs> there? Yeah, portables. That's probably the one of the most vulnerable. We have to get kids from in there because I'm sure you don't have them restrooms on the outside, right? So we have to get them inside. So we went to access control and just gave one to the teacher. Remember the old... <clears throat> go to the restroom, you hang the door key. I'm, I'm, I'm showing my age. Uh, the, uh, the key there, well, now you have access control. We we'll give it to the kid, goes in there, gets, in, gets out, does whatever he needs to do, and so forth so on. You have to think about those kinds of things that are low cost, high impact, but just make sense uh, in, an, in a school environment. And that's a, that's a perfect example of what I, I believe is a, is a mandate that just doesn't make sense for a school. You know, I understand the importance of having a locked classroom, but I also feel like it kind of gives a false sense of security because that's not how schools operate on a daily basis, specifically at the elementary school level, where they are going to, you know, the library, where they're going out to breakout spaces. Heck, think about a high school level. I mean, I don't know how many times I was tardy or, you know, from or trying to skip class and got caught and sent back to class. Operating in that always door locked environment sometimes <coughs> and often is not, you know, conducive to actually how our schools operate. <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the issues that I've seen in the response I've done to school threats and uh, school shootings is that we struggle uh, to get master keys, classroom keys, to cops when they come in, and it delays the room clearing protocols. 
uh, in Uvalde, they waited for keys. They couldn't find a key. Now it turns out the classroom door uh, was lock was broken. It had a work order in for quite some time. Uh, but we've seen this time and time again where law enforcement comes in and says, we need keys to clear and nobody can give them keys because everybody's locked down. So I came up with the idea that we were going to create uh, five master keys in every school and we'd put them in the Knox box. But the fire department and the police department don't like each other. So the fire department said, no, you can't use our Knox box. <laughs> So I created the cop box, for lack of a better word. And it's right next to the Knox box. So now they can have five keys. Um, it's thinking about those things. And then from a facility standpoint, what I heard from our, our facilities chief was, yeah, but what if the cops lose the keys? OK. Um, we can get them back at the end of the room clearing protocol. But if they lose the keys, isn't it better that they lose a key? and we fix that issue than delaying our opportunity to get in that classroom and save a life. So just a thought, um, because that's an operational issue. You at your level can make sure that you are prepared and ready and staged and have something that's critically important moment in time. When those doors are secured, how do you get in? John, how many doors but did they break down at Arapaho? Oh. They had to go back and replace. They, I think it was. It was. It was guy, over forty. Is Guy Grace in here? No. <laughs> oh, uh, he was here earlier. Uh, yeah, it was over forty. I know at Columbine it was sixty-two doors that they had to breach. Um, in fact, our SWAT team leader asked a teacher for the key, and the teacher said, "No, I can't give it to you. I'm not allowed." <laughs> wow. The SWAT team leader said, "Give me your damn key." <laughs> I mean, keys are sacred, right? So. Um, <laughs> and Mr. Mr. McDonald? Yes, sir. Right, right over here. Where's I know here? you're by the, by the light. <laughs> I'm not God. <laughs> uh, so we have a couple more questions just to keep this rolling. This is good. You know, it's good to have participation from the audience. This gentleman first, and then there's a young lady over here. Great. Uh, John Dufay from Albuquerque. One thing you guys haven't mentioned, I know you've worked with them a lot, but the one partner in this whole thing of security has to be the fire marshal. <laughs> yes. And oh, yeah. they have jurisdiction over everything. Yeah. Um, a lot of our plans were the same thing. What we think about fire marshals looks and says, no, you that doesn't work. So that's the other part of the security that needs to be blended well is with the fire marshal issues and life and safety from their point of view. Yeah. But one of our, um, you know, right, right after Stoneman Douglas, the immediate reaction was to create these security vestibules, right? And, you know, single point of entry areas, or some people call them that. And we, we started doing that without, without going through plan review with the, with the fire. Our, actually, our fire marshal works for our school district. Our building official is our fire marshal who also works for the school district. But they have they have a license that's separate and apart, so I can't tell him what to do or what not to do. But yeah, they started putting up walls and doors and card readers and stuff like that, and then we were finding that we were creating you know, dead-end corridors and stuff like that, and that, so that became a problem. And then, so to go back and, and explain to our, you know, we were moving fast, and go back and explain to our board members, you know, we have to slow this process down because we have to actually get designs, we have to get permits. You know, sometimes it affects the air conditioning, sometimes it affects the electrical. Um, but mostly, you know, it's, it's about making sure we have proper ingress and egress in our, in our schools. So, it, you know, I, I'd like to be able to say we can, we can get all these things done quickly like that, but without engaging the fire marshal, as you mentioned, that slows you down. And that's the same thing with the, the classroom doors. And we, we, we went to the classroom, uh, the storage room function on our classrooms. But again, it, our expectation, and, and again, I talk about the inconvenience of safety, of safety and security, our expectation in secondary schools is that that, that door is locked all the time, and during class changes, that teacher is there holding at the door, watching kids go up and down the hallway, letting students in and out the classroom, and when the, when the bell rings, they close the door and, and, and teach the class. It's, there's, no, there's no exceptions, you know, so you have to, you have to deal with that 
uh, because there was fire safety codes and there's other things that we gotta we have to comply you with. You know, one of the one of the things that uh, hit us pretty hard, uh, we said secure your campus, right? We all have fencing around the campus, and the old chain goes around the gate on the exterior, and we're saying no. Oof. That's just a violation. I don't know how many fire codes they are. So we had to go train our folks and had to go out there and visit with them. And I met with all the principals and I said, if you have an issue like that, call us. We'll go do an assessment quickly and looking at the fire code because that's the one that's going to hit you, right? You're not supposed to chain things down, right? And so then they started asking for the, uh, the panic hardware on the exterior that has a self-closure and things of that nature. And I got about 30 or 40 requests in about two months because that's what we need to do. So we had to put a program together to see if we can get uh, folks to get, do the installation. But that one of, one of the ones that hit us really, really hard pretty fast. Uh, and of course, uh, doors and things of that nature. You've got so we have a great relationship in, in, in San Antonio. We have, we're part of an, an ILA, interlocal agreement with the city of San Antonio on developmental services that looks at our plans and specifications. Uh, and things of that nature, and we meet with them quarterly, and we talk to them about the, the, the dynamics of trying to deal with security at the same time with fire codes. And they sit, they're sitting at the table with us, and we have an open discussion about what does that look like for us and what we have to do to secure the campus that uh, will help us uh, in the long run. Uh, and they, they're, they're, they're at the table, so they have a conversation with us. Uh, so Gloria has a question right here. Go ahead. Well, it's kind of a question, but it's kind of a comment. Uh, my name is Gloria Barrera. I'm the Chief of Operations and Facilities for Waco ISD. Um, I have a question. You don't have to tell me the answer, but have any of you ever toured a modern jail facility? Yes. And if you have toured a modern jail facility, then you've seen a very good layout of many of our schools, even as we sit here today and we're doing all this new design thought. The idea that teacher keeping a classroom door locked is a good thing for education is not a good idea. That's not how it works. We know evidence-based that teachers do better collaborating, students do better when they have more autonomy, and here we are pushing ourselves into the 1950s model, locking all the classroom doors and treating them like they're in jail. So that's my observation. Um, I was struck when I saw the jail with how similar it was. And that's what they do in jail. Mm. They don't let you go places. They lock the doors behind you. They treat you like you're going to do something bad. I, I would say this. So anyway, that's, that's my comment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good comment. We're places of reading and writing and arithmetic. That's what we were originally designed for. Yet now you take the reading, you draw a line as social emotional learning. You take the writing, you draw a line as threat management. You take the, the arithmetic, you draw a line, and it's just feeding and clothing kids. The world's changed. And schools are not designed operationally for this type of work. Yet we're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. It's not working well. Any other uh, questions before we move? We got Dana over here, and there's a gentleman, I think, right over there after her. <coughs> Hi, Dana Fox, Chief Operating Officer for Richmond Public Schools. We have had two school shootings this year, one in April, one in June. The one in June, the media classified as a mass shooting because two people died. Um, it was at a graduation, so it wasn't at our schools. But what I think is super important to talk about here, and it hasn't been <clears> mentioned, <throat> is social media and how fast these threats become credible. So having locked doors and having the things, that's when the threat is there. And it's really important for everyone in this room to recognize when the threat is coming. And I think for so many people, you don't think about Snapchat and TikTok as being something that you're interested in, but it's so important. We have staff that have spoof accounts that follow student accounts. So we know when things are brewing, I have a high school freshman, my son, we, we live an hour from the district that I work in, but even he can see things that are happening in my district. So on two or three occasions, he's come to me at home and been like, have you seen this? And I look at it and then I'm able to, to contact our director of, of school safety and say, hey, this is going around, this is brewing. Um, so I think it's really, really important if you don't have a social media account to get one, get a spoof one, have, have your staff have a spoof account 
to stay in line with these with these social media things because it it becomes it happens so quickly where it becomes a credible threat and sometimes you can be more proactive than reactive and I just think it's it's paramount that you talk about social media when you talk about school safety. You're absolutely that's, right. Yeah, I was going to say that's a great point. I know we bought a software program that long ago that looks for social media uh, in our student accounts as well and picks up very key words that gets us an idea as to whether we're going to have an issue or not. Uh, and then that goes directly to administration and to the police department. And they take it and they have to analyze it and then act upon it. But those kinds of things now are becoming, uh, I agree with you, social media is, it, it could be helpful, but it could be a detriment. Think about, uh, you know, somebody saying there's, there's a potential shooting at a, at a high school. I know a good friend here had to deal with, I uh, think at Jefferson, where they just converge on that school. Those are, these are parents coming in, trying to knock the door down and trying to knock down police officers because they were trying to get those kids out. Uh, it was just a threat, and they had it under control. <clears throat> I know they did, because it's they, they, what they do. They practice that all the time. We have uh, Paul here from Garland, Texas. Good morning. Um, again, Paul Gonzalez, Executive Director of Garland ISD. The <clears throat> question I have is uh, the last bomb program, uh, this current bomb program we just uh, entered, uh, calls for securing all of our facilities with exterior fencing. Um, I'd like to hear how your district um, dealt with the community. Uh, these schools were originally designed with open campuses where the community and the children could come during the weekends and play on the playgrounds. How did you engage with the community to get buy-in and securing your, your school campuses? Well, in, in Palm Beach, I could... We've had fences for a long time, so it's, it's really hasn't <coughs> been a, um, a recent change for us. But one, one of the things that we, we do and maybe could help in your situation is that, um, is that we have into local, into local agreements with all of the different municipalities in the, in the county. And then um, between, the, so we, we allow organized um, activities on our, on our campuses, not just neighborhood, neighbors that want to get together and play basketball or softball or whatever the case. So if you're if it's an organized August uh, event through the local municipality that has a softball team or softball um, league or whatever the case or a basketball league, that's the way that they get access to our campuses. So unfortunately, it's not everybody just just can walk up and, and play on our our campuses. Yeah, I think we're still trying to to figure it out, right? I mean, we got a lot of older schools that don't have perimeter fencing, or some of them have the old chain link fence, you know. Um, and some of them have a section of fence and then an opening and another section of fence. And so really, you know, what are you trying to deter there? I understand that trying to create, again, comp compartmentalization, right? Single point of entry, one point in, one point out. But, you know, you're still going to have visitors. You're still going to have volunteers. You're still going to have substitute teachers. And so they're going to have to have a way to get into, you know, that perimeter on a daily basis. And so... Um, so we're still looking at that. Um, me personally, I'm not um, uh, a huge proponent of just encompassing your entire campus with a fence. I don't like the look of it. I think it goes back to the jail look. Um, I'm also a proponent of if we can if we can use fencing um, uh, in a, in addition to access control and putting that electronic you know, security in there as well, then I think, you know, that's where we should be looking um, so we can have electronic control of those entry points. It's very expensive to do because now you got to, you got to, you got to trench out to those locations. You got to, you know, run cable, all that stuff. So it's, it, it's a challenge. And um, we just got a $1.9 million grant from the state of Texas. And that's not even going to come close to what we need to try to put fencing up. So buy-in, that's very important. Um, we're mandated in the state of Texas to have a safety and security committee. And we put a pretty sizable safety and security committee comprises of parents of different levels, high school, middle school, uh, elementary school. We have two board members. We have, uh, of course, police, all central office administrators, and a multitude of different campus administrators. And we have four high school students in an effort to be able to gather uh, information, share information, and gather information from them and get suggestions. And 
when you put students in a panel that comprehensive, be surprised what you get. Uh, some suggestions are coming from them. It makes you want to pause and think, rethink things. So it's, uh, it's a way to be able to engage the community, not the entire community, but a portion of the community, the representatives. Uh, and then we have bonds, uh, citizens advisory committees that we present information to that's comprising of business members, uh, parents, some parents and things of that nature. But we share what our thoughts are about security, and how to secure different models. We have about three different models in our school district. Uh, and then we, we do studies. Uh, we just finished up our middle school study of all 22 middle to see where the vulnerabilities are. We hired an architect who's very savvy in safety and security, uh, and they're going to give us recommendations on how to secure uh, for the, the campus uh, in, a, in a multitude of different ways. Um, so it, we just it's a constant thing with us trying to figure out the best way, again, not looking like a prison, looking like it's a detention center of any, of any sort. Um, and it's very challenging, because my, uh, my friend here has you know, open schools. Remember, still dealing with campuses that are 60 years old, 75 mm -hmm. and 80 years old, that there was no air conditioning. But guess what? There were breezeways, right? That's the old model. And try to mitigate those uh, in some fashion, way, or form. It's very, very, very challenging. And yes, we present the pretty pictures and say, this is option one. We've even gone as far as I told one architect, just put a storefront where the fencing is and make it look like the front and see what that looks like. We got some positive feedback on that one. Uh, but, you know, anything you can do to mitigate it, to mitigate that look. So we're down to about nine minutes. And my last question for all of you, <coughs> um, and then maybe we have time for one or two more questions, is what do you see as the emerging issue in the world of K-12 facilities and school safety? What's on each of your radars right now? Excellent. So on Wednesday, when I get back, we have a board item to, to put um, security film on our the windows. Yep. Um, actually, it's something that I heard from colleagues when I attended this conference last, last year. So um, our schools that have, have impact glass, which were the schools that built from 2006 on, don't have to not worry about those. But the ones that are built earlier than that, uh, we're going to put, so we just, this is a $4 million contract to Cover, I think, like 110 schools um, to put this security film on. That's that's definitely a big issue for us, right? So I think that's one of the big examples. Yep, that window film is a big conversation. I think uh, you know. I think for us right now is really looking at artificial intelligence, AI, and how we're incorporating that into our physical security program, using our cameras, using our um, you know other technology to you know pick up the the. The, uh, the unusual, to, to be smart about, you know, we've got over 5,000 cameras in our district. And I think this, the stats show that, you know, out of that, over a course of a week, maybe we get eight hours of active monitoring at the most. And so most of our cameras have now become, you know, used for investigation purposes. But we can use that technology to alert us to the unknown or to the unusual. Then we are now getting ahead of, you know, some of the criminal activity or other issues. I think also right now there's a huge push for gun detection in schools. Um, you know, we have companies, you know, out there that will, you know, alert you if, if, if there's somebody brandishing a gun. Um, um, you know, again, utilizing all of those types of smart technologies to, uh, to mitigate your safety program. But again, that's all from a response, right? It's not from a prevention. It's from a response um, um, uh, lens. So for us, we started looking at this some time ago, and we convinced ourselves that security is everybody's business, period, across the board. Where there are children that are there being taught every single day to a teacher, to a parent, to a community member, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the offshoots of our, of our, uh, our discussions that went into play is we asked our principals, do you have volunteers that could come on the campus every so often um, and, and, and help. And so now we start to see that more often at the campuses where you have the daddies on patrol or they call them different names for different reasons at every single school. They get their own shirts, right? And we train them up a little bit on what to look for and things of that nature. But that presence becomes so important 
in an effort to be able to secure campuses and to get a watchful eye of what's going out in the community. Mike had, had mentioned some time ago uh, when we we're having a discussion that whatever you do to fortify a, a campus, it's not enough. It's never going to be the end. What we're hoping is that we can buy time. Anything you could do to make, uh, make it difficult for somebody to breach a, a campus is probably uh, at least part of the answer. So the film is not going to stop a bullet, but it will keep it from shattering. You can, walk, you can actually walk through it, right? Security lobby will only get you so much unless you got ballistic high level of, of prison looking uh, glass or uh, performing glass. That's not going to stop an intruder if they really want to get in there and so forth and so on. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story how, how resourceful our kids are. So we put these uh, gates, right? Beautiful gates, right? Our gates. Then you put the push bar on the other side, right? They're about six feet tall because that's considerable, not unscalable. And we're watching a camera for a kid who was trying to get in, he was late to class, takes a backpack, swings it over, hits the bar, opens it, and walks right in. Never thought about that. <laughs> Very resourceful. I think we need to hire that guy. <laughs> oh, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah, we'll always find a way, and you always have to be cognizant of everything that's happening uh, in and around the campus. We got uh, about five minutes left here. This is Carmela from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Hi. I, um, I actually like that we're talking about facilities because my question relates to that, and specifically to the size of the facilities that we continue to build. They seem to, every year to get larger. You know, we have elementaries now that can accommodate 1,500 kids, which is like a junior college. Is there any type of movement, uh, any type of lobbying toward ensuring that our schools are a reasonable size, that's manageable, so that when we have these emergency issues, we're actually able to secure individuals? I'm thinking of kids with disabilities, adults with disabilities, just how difficult it is to clear and secure the individuals on the campus. And the larger the, the size of the, the facility is, the more difficult it is to do that. Oh, about closing schools, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, our school, Florida has big schools. Um, Texas has big schools. So we're talking about the big school districts, right? So our, our elementaries are nine, 970. Middle schools are about 13 to 1,500. And our high schools are about 2,500. So those are pretty good size. And then the legislation... Um, was passed several years ago to create schools within schools and try to make them feel smaller. So, uh, but basically, it's taking the, you know, it's trying to create little houses, houses within schools. Um, we're we're not moving to close down our smaller. We do have we have, we are rebuilding some of our smaller schools and keeping them relatively small. When I say relatively small, I mean it's small for us is six hundred students, six to seven hundred for for an elementary school. Um, but yeah, we're we're not. Fortunately, we're not moving to combine schools, but we're definitely not moving to, to make brand new schools smaller, unfortunately. It's, but that mental health issue is definitely a, a big part of it. There's no standards that I've seen across the country in size of school. What I have seen, though, in new builds that's really concerning is the amount of glass and the fact that there's no defensible space for kids and teachers to hide in classrooms. So as they're building these new schools, we look at glass and we say glass kills. Others look at glass and say it's aesthetically pleasing, it's open, it's an environment that kids feel like they're free to move in and, and have access to. There has to be a balance there in all of this. And, and we're struggling to find that balance. So what's interesting about your question is, philosophically, as a school system, you have to ask yourself, what is the right size for educating kids? Right? So that goes counter to some of the other things that we're talking about, the mega schools, so to speak. And so for us, a long time ago, we settled on 800. That is the perfect size for us, for our culture, for our school district, and what we believe we can deliver uh, 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 great instruction to our, to our students. So it's 800 for us, so it, and it's a community school. And that's what the boards wrestled with many moons ago is, you know, how big is big, right? So 800 for us is the maximum that we will build. Uh, and yes, we build them. I've got 83, and I'm in my 84th now uh, because of pockets. Uh, and so that's challenging from that perspective because it takes more money to, to build. And that's the balance that you have to find. Our middle schools are 1,400 to 1,600 core, and then our high schools are 28. 
to almost 3,000. Uh, and those are the ones that are probably more challenging. But we, we challenge our architects to look at opportunities to be able to look at layouts. It's no secret that if you've been in this business long enough that administrators a long time ago want clear line of sight so they can manage better in a large school, a high school, for example. They wanted the monumental stairs in the middle so they could sit, uh, or not sit, but watch what's going on on all those corridors and things of that nature. So that's something that we have adopted for many, many years and it became even more critical. And yes, we have to tell our architects every once in a while, and I'm trained as one, so um, for those that don't get offended, uh, you gotta think about that first, is how do you operate a school? The pretty things and so forth and so on, they're important, but you gotta operate a school and that stays there for 50 to 75 to 100 years. So those are kinds of things that we look at um, from, a, from a design perspective. And as we, re, as we rebuild, we'll do the same thing as well. And yes, we have film, that we studied that film and things like that. We had uh, a session where our police department actually shot, I don't know how many films and see what they would get at it. I was asked a strange question from my police department. Do you have any old buildings you're gonna knock down? And I said, oh yeah, we got about 10 of them we're gonna knock down. Give me first shot at it. And I said, what do you mean first shot at it? That doesn't even sound right. I wanna go breach one of them. So right now we're asking, we are actually telling our police department, you got about 10 days before I knock this building down, have at it, <laughs> right? And then that's what they learn because reality is, how can you bridge? Uh, if they can breach it, then what are the vulnerabilities that we may have? So interesting things that come out of discussions with our partners and our other colleagues. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Thank you to our great panel. Uh, we appreciate your time today.